at the conference. Uh, so I am blown away that you found a, uh, a uh, quiet space where you could join us for the discussion today. It's my pleasure to be here. Yeah, we're doing the 38th conference uh, and we're tackling mental health and older adults. And so a uh, good group here today, but always wonderful to be with you. Well, and the Silver Group is one of the positive aging community champions that supports what we do. And I, I want to thank you so much. But uh, tell us a little bit about the Silver Group and what you do to support older adults. So thanks for the chance to share. Uh, I'm 10 years in this role and 10 years directing this program, which is the seniors real estate facing uh, thing that we do within Bob Lacido team, Keller Williams Lacido agency. Uh, my role is not to be there as the realtor. One of the terms that's been big at the conference today has been silo. And so if you look at any industry and you say in my role, there's a stager, there's a move manager, there's a downsizer, there's a realtor, there's an estate attorney, there's a financial planner, there's the landscape of senior living, there's placement, there's aging life care managers. I get to be none of those specialists, but I get to be my own specialist as a navigator and a guide through all of those categories, all those silos, and make sure that people are connected and educated and advocated for and empowered to sort of pick and choose what they do need. Um, and that has been my joy for the past 10 years. Man, when you're rattling down that list, uh, there are a lot of silos in our field, and it's no wonder that it's confusing to folks that suddenly find themselves thrown into this, this segment. But uh, having navigators like yourself out there really helps a lot of folks. So before you jump off today, I want to make sure that you drop your contact info into chat for everybody. And, um, and before we jump on to uh, meeting Rachel, let me just share a couple of little housekeeping things that will help you all through today. The first thing is you can connect with positive aging champions like Vicki um, on our website at proaging.com. You see the search engine up there at the top. You can order free copies of source book, as many as you need as well. But the important thing for today is today's discussion is recorded. So it will be live and up here uh, in video and podcast format later today on the left-hand side of the screen. And then on the right-hand side of the screen, you can see what we've got coming up. And I just want to give you a preview to, we. I can't believe that it's already the end of May, but um, we got three more discussions. Uh, the, the Tomorrow, I, I can't wait for this one. You're going to get to meet uh, some of the residents and the director of a musical theater program in a retirement community, but they're not doing Bye Bye Birdie. They've created their own script that's about the lives of the residents who are the actors on stage. You're gonna to get to meet some of the, the actors and Robbie Hutter. And then on Friday, or no, on Thursday, probably most of you in the audience are familiar with Next Door. Well, in Belgium, they have a next door, but they've taken a radically different approach to building community through that technology. And so we're going to meet Jenik from Belgium to talk about that program. And I can't wait to share that with you. And then our last discussion of the day of the month is going to be about accessible dwelling units. And um, we've got a company wheel pad that's going to be featured on the National Mall on June uh, 9 through 11 at the uh, at the housing uh, innovative housing showcase. So we've got some really cool stuff uh, planned for you uh, this week and next, and then into June, July, and August as well. But today we are talking about the topic of what to do with the all those photos. We've had one discussion on here, and we couldn't answer all the questions. And so I'm delighted to have Rachel Jenkins joining us from the uh, photo archivers. And we wouldn't have Rachel if it wasn't for Vicki. Uh, and when Vicki was part of that first discussion, she goes, I've got a great resource for you. So uh, Rachel, if you wanna join us on stage, we can uh, kick this off. Um, so, hey there. Hey, um, how are you? 
Hi, so, um, anyways, uh, uh, Rachel, before we dive into what to do with all the photos, let's uh, get to know you a little bit better. Tell us a little bit about your background. Um, so I live in Columbia, Maryland, and I started this business in 2010 um, as a way to, um, I, I was creating my own books for my own family. I had got myself back into photography again because I had small kids. So I now had a new subject and I wanted to make sure that those pictures were someplace that we could look at. And so I started doing some scrapbooks and I started my business and it kind of all evolved from there. I wanted to do books for other people. I quickly realized that it was not necessarily a sustainable business model. So quickly evolved into helping people get organized with their photos. And then we moved into digitizing those photos. And um, now we do kind of all of those pieces, organizing, digitizing, and then, uh, you know, create custom books for people. And you're going to uh, share some of these processes with us today. Uh, Vicki, uh, the, um, when, when you and your, your team lists a home for somebody who might be interested in making a move, do you often, uh, does, does the, the topic of what am I going to do with all these photos, uh, come into the discussion? It absolutely does. And, you know, the professional guidance is for people who are embarking on the downsize and the move to not touch the photos. Uh, because, you know, and Rachel's going to probably take you really down into the into the weeds here in the best possible way. Uh, it is uh, ripping the lid off of all the emotions. You know, you're looking at life in review. You're looking at places you went. You're looking at people that aren't around anymore. Kids are grown. It's just an emotional minefield uh, as we experience it in our part of the, uh, the process. And our guidance is to please know that there are resources available. People are, you know, gobsmacked that uh, somebody like Rachel exists and can take it on. Uh, and then the guidance is to leave it until they get moved over and the snow is falling and their feet are up and the dust is settled from the process of going through the downsides and the move and then get your hands dirty with that. Uh, flip side of that would be to be really proactive and to be doing it so far ahead that you're not even in the downsize move process, you're tackling that first. Um, so, you know, to see it as a middle-aged adult, to see it as the adult kid trying to do for my parents and their collection, and then trying to be out there in the professional world, guiding people through um, the challenge. You know, Rachel's just been invaluable. Yeah, and you know, I never thought about it that way, but but the good thing about photos is whether they're digital or print, they take up a lot less space. It's not like you're taking the 14 foot armoire to your new home. And this can be a project th that after you move, you can tackle it versus all the other stuff that you're going to have to tackle if you're listing the home and what have you. Um, I never thought of it that way, but that's that's why we've got you there, Vic. And uh, you've gone through this real life with a lot of your clients. So um, excellent. Well, uh, Rachel, I think you've got some slides that you've put together to sort of kick off the conversation with us today. So I'm going to duck behind the curtain here and let you share your screen. But I want to remind the audience to any questions you've got, just throw them in and we will tackle uh, those in today's discussion. The best part about talking about this is that we're not alone and we can, um, can have a conversation and brainstorm on some of the ideal solutions. So I'm going to duck behind the curtain here. And uh, Vic, make sure you drop your uh, your your stuff into the uh, into chat there as well. Awesome, thanks, Vic. And yes, yeah, Steve. Um, by all means, anybody has any questions that come up, I do not need to hear myself talk. So, um, if there are things that we can kind of address organically as it comes up, I'm happy to do so. I, I don't mind, um, you know, stopping and starting on that. So. Got it. All right. Can everyone see it? You can yep. see my screen? Yep, oh. we got it. Okay. Um, so I'll start by saying is that most people feel like this is a burden, this whole process, especially if you are in, in the process of looking at downsizing or transitioning your, you know, your 
family or your parents into new housing or a new home, uh, this can be an incredibly overwhelming task. And I think Vic hit the nail on the head is that now is not the time if you are if it is if it if you are on the edge of that move now is not the time to dig into the photos um, because it can be so overwhelming and it is many many tiny little decisions that you have to make when you're um, downsizing a, a photo collection so it might not be the best time to add those many thousands of little tiny decisions that you need to make along with trying to decide you know where you want to live. Um, so the goal of today is just to kind of give you an idea of the start and a little bit of the middle and what the end can look like when you're doing this process. It, it's, there's a lot of steps. So I'm never gonna be able to cover all of them in, in you know, the time frame that we have here today, but I'm gonna try and, and cover as much as I can and know that you know, physical photo collections are different from digital photo collections. They are two separate beasts and they are, um, they need attention in two different ways, but there are some things that are, are similar, right? But for the most part, you kind of have to look at one, manage that, and then look at the other and manage that. And not necessarily something to try and do at the same time as well. So, our time together really is just going to be some initial steps to help you get started and consolidating that collection and maybe do some initial downsizing. Um, we actually had a guest that was going to be coming today and she has fallen ill. So she's not going to be with us today, unfortunately, but I will talk a little bit about what her experience was like. I really wanted you to hear it from her, but um, maybe we can do that at a separate time. Um, but she came at this um, both from her own collection and from her parents' collection. And then I wanted to address, you know, when it's time to ask for help and what areas might make sense for you to ask for help. So these are my sons. They love having their picture taken. Um, and my point here is that you do reap what you sow. I think that we as adult children have more than likely inherited photos from our parents who inherited photos from their parents and those photos have a tendency to end up in the basement or the garage or the attic, and they're dusty and they're dirty and mouse droppings and who knows what's in, in some of those boxes. Actually, I know what's in some of those boxes because I've seen them. Um, but if we, if we continue to just pass those along, those photos really aren't going to be seen again and appreciated again. So I hear very often from our clients that my kids don't care about these photos. They're not going to care about these photos. I don't want them or my kids aren't going to want them. Um, they're not going to want them if they're dusty and dirty and moldy and a complete chaos. So what I would say is the true gift to our next generation is consolidating these collections, downsizing them, really selecting the keepers and and removing the rest, getting them digitized so that this next generation has a way to appreciate them. They're not gonna be looking in our boxes and you know, flipping through those photos. Um, they wanna be able to look at maybe a website or maybe an easy book to open. Um, so you reap what you sow. If you think that it's just gonna be, nobody's gonna care, then probably nobody's gonna care. But if we treat those collections with, with a little bit of respect, rehousing them in archival boxes and they're beautiful and they're organized, I think our children are gonna appreciate them much more. Um, yep, I can talk about the um, framed photos as well. We can get to that for sure. So this is a collection that came in recently and, and I just ask, you know, can you relate to this? Uh, this is actually, this, version of the collection actually looks a little bit better than when it originally arrived. So in this stack of bins, we did some consolidation and, and you know, paring things down a little bit and probably reduced the size of it almost immediately without even throwing things away. Um, but this slide really is more about how does this relate to you? And I think Photo chaos is relatable to pretty much everybody, whether it's digital or it's a physical collection. 
Um, yeah, the uh, I can definitely relate to it, uh, <laughs> Rachel. And the um, uh, although I like that there's plastic boxes because what I got was uh, a lot of shoe boxes and uh, really bizarre um, <laughs> containers. Um, yes. Well, and those bins actually are our bins. So a lot of stuff came in those original bazaar boxes that you okay. talked about. <laughs> All right. And then um, let's see, Ruth is asking to increase the volume. Uh, Ruth, I think our volume should be good. If you if you can adjust the volume on your computer, uh, if you're having difficulty hearing, uh, I, 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 I hope that... Uh, I, I hope that's the problem, and I hope that not everybody is having difficulties hearing us. Um, okay. Are All you right. able to hear me okay, Steve? I, I'm able to hear you okay, okay. Uh, and so um, ho hopefully Ruth and any others that can't uh, hear the volume correctly, uh, okay. Okay, I did other see other folks say there. that they're hearing us, so so Ruth, and, and you might just log in and log out again if the... Uh, if the volume's not loud enough. Okay. All right. Back to uh, photo organizing here. All right. So, you know, have you started this process multiple times and just gotten stuck? I hear that many, many times, just even knowing where to start. Um, maybe you're ready to downsize, but the photos are really what's hanging you up. Like, what am I going to do with all of these photos? Um, some people are feeling like the photo gatekeeper. They've been, they've inherited their uh, family photos and now they have relatives that are saying, hey, when are you going to do something with those photos? Uh, we probably all heard that before. And maybe you just need to get some of that space back in your closet. Maybe you're not downsizing your physical home, but maybe you would like to start to minimize and gain some closet space back. Um, so those are all things that I hear on a pretty regular basis when we have clients that are coming to us. So um, I would guess that that's pretty relatable to most folks. Um, so the next thing to consider is when you're actually getting started with this process, think about the end, right? What do you want the end to look like? Do you want them to be uh, physically organized photos? Do you want a digital collection? Do you want a family website? Uh, do you want books? Do you want to be able to design the books yourself? But getting to that fun part has been or seemed impossible because you had all of these physical photos. And every time you go to look for a photo that you want to put in that book, um, you find overwhelm and you close those boxes back up and stick them back in the closet. Um, something else to think about is, are you going to be doing the scanning or are you going to hire a professional to, to do the scanning? Uh, and who else is going to want access to these photos? Is this for children? Is it for siblings? Is it for your parents? Um, and the big question here, especially when we're talking about downsizing is, do I have a deadline for this project? If I am looking to downsize and buy a new home and I'm trying to get my home staged, what am I going to do with these boxes of photos in the interim? Right? Because it's almost impossible if you're within a couple of months of moving to try and attack your photos at this point stage of the game, it's probably a little bit too late. So um, I think Vicar, uh, Steve mentioned, you know, wait till the, it's, the snow is falling and you can kick your feet up. Um, you know, it might be a case where this is the time that you do want to hire a professional and you drop those boxes off, right? We have that happen all the time is folks are staging their home or they're staging their parents' home and they just need to get those boxes out of there. So they drop them off here knowing that we're going to be working on it, but they can get those boxes out of the way. Um, some of the basic tools uh, are, you know, gloves, a mask. If you know for a fact that those photos are going to be moldy, you might want to have uh, a mask. We've all got a few of those around now, unfortunately. Um, a photo safe pencil so that you can start to transfer information to the backs of those photos. Again, this is the rabbit hole though, right? So depending on where you are in the stage of, of organizing, this can be where the real rabbit hole starts to happen and you can start to get overwhelmed. But Having a photo safe pencil that you can transfer information from envelopes onto those photos is helpful, or you can identify people. Uh, having some four by six cards, some sticky notes, archival boxes, or even just some temporary shoe boxes to hold those photos until after they've been digitized. Uh, having some plastic bins that you can 
put things back in when you're done. If you don't have the space available and you need to be putting things away at the end of each session that you're going to be working on your photos, uh, have some plastic bins that you can put those photos in, stack them up and at least get them out of the way. And then, um, I, Hey, uh, Rachel, uh, yes. a question on photo safe pencils. Mm -hmm. So what is this? The, the concept is that you can write on a photo without damaging it. Is that what they do? Yeah, it looks, looks similar to this. Um, so it's got a soft, it's got a soft tip. So what makes that different is that, um, it's kind of like a, almost like a grease pencil, I guess is what it's called. Um, but, um, uh, the pencil is better than the pen because sometimes the pen is going to leave an indentation on the back of the photo. Uh, also the ink and the pen might not be archival. So, and you also don't want the ink to smudge onto the face of the next photo. So that's why we do encourage these pencils because they're soft. So they're not gonna press into the back of the photo. Um, and, and it's just, it's easier on your photos, especially when they're stacked together. Okay, great. Um, and then by all means have a garbage bin because you need to purge. Got to get rid of the sunsets and the landscapes because those probably are the photos that your kids don't want, right? The, um, the trip that you took and you took 20 landscape photos that isn't going to hold necessarily a meaning, a meaning to your children. So those are the ones that you can start to purge. And the ones that if they do mean something to you, by all means, keep them, but you don't necessarily need to have those scanned. Um, we all have our, we all have our food and uh, sunset and landscape photos. And the next generation may not necessarily want them because they've got their own. Then one of the tools that I didn't mention here is, is family, family and friends. So this is also one of those rabbit holes. Um, so letting your family know that you're working on this project is actually can be helpful or it can be a hindrance. You have to know your family. <laughs> Some family's going to come in and they're going to keep you moving along and they're going to help you curate those photos and sort through them. You may have other family that slows you down because they're going to be reminiscing right along with you. So this is one of the things that uh, Vic touched on at the beginning is that you start reminiscing on each and every one of those photos. You, it is going to slow you down. Um, and not that that can't be a good process because it can be, but timing is everything on that. So choose wisely who you let know that you are working on this project. You also don't want somebody saying, oh, I've got four shoe boxes I can hand off to you. So make sure that you choose wisely, make sure that it's a good partner. Um, maybe you and a partner could work on your photos each at the same time, maybe you trade. You work on their photos, they work on your photos because we're not as emotionally attached to somebody else's photos which is why it makes it easier for us as professionals to get through those and organize other people's photos a little bit faster because we are not emotionally attached to those photos, right? So choose wisely, but it can be a great tool. Um, the two things that you really, you're gonna commit to in this process is space and time, right? Those are the things that you need for this project if you're going to be doing this on your own. You need to commit to the time and you need to commit to the space. So you know, clearing the decks and having some space to actually work on this project is kind of a big deal. It might be a spare bedroom where you can close the door and walk away. But again, know thyself. If you close that door and walk away, are you going to walk away forever and not come back to it? Or are you pretty good about establishing those boundaries and saying, I need to work on this an hour every day until I get it to the level of organization that I want. Um, so, you know, get the cat off the table, have some dedicated space, whether it's a dining room table or a banquet table, a spare bedroom bed. Uh, maybe you need the room with the door because you've got a cat that's gonna be knocking your photos off the, off the table. Um, but maybe you're the person that needs it to be on your dining room table to keep you motivated to move it along. 
um, and have, again, have some of those plastic bins with lids around so that they are stackable and you can put them away if you do need to have uh, dinner at that table. So hunting and gathering, that's kind of the first step. Once you've cleared the decks, you've established some time frames that you want to work within. Um, doing that hunting and gathering is an important step. Photos could be in the closets or the basements or the attics, um, under the beds, in the drawers. So the first step is getting everything in one place so you know, you know the level of, of collection that you have. Um, there's nothing worse than getting all the way through, having everything organized and finding that one last box that needs to now be integrated into this collection. So I encourage you to take your time on this one, really think about where you might have some of those photos hidden. Um, you know, the framed photos that uh, someone asked about here, um, those are things that you can pull them out, put like with like, right? So maybe you have a bin for all of your framed photos that you are not gonna be returning to the walls or the, or the dressers uh, or the shelves. Uh, maybe there's a bin of framed pieces that you know you wanna have those framed pieces digitized um, and you're gonna return them to the frames and put them back in your home for display. Um, or maybe we'll make reprints for those and store the originals if they've started to be faded. Um, a bin for all of the albums so that you can decide what you want to do with those albums. Having like with like allows you to be able to compartmentalize those decisions. So you can really make a solid decision on, okay, I have 30 albums. Do I really want to put them back out on the shelves? Have they been in the boxes for 10 years already and I haven't cracked them open? It allows you to be able to make decisions around those smaller groupings uh, versus having everything just kind of scattered everywhere. Um, if there's groups of photos that are together, keep them together for now because they may have been curated that way for a reason, uh, especially if there are photos that, that weren't yours. They were maybe a, a ancestor or a family member um, until you really can see that whole collection and see how things are coming together and, and establish what the patterns are. It's going to be important for you to just kind of keep those together for now because they will help lead you into some further organization and potentially dating those photos. Um, this stage really can be kind of ugly. <laughs> so don't be discouraged at this stage. Um, celebrate the win of getting it all together and really having an idea of the magnitude of your project, or maybe it's not as big as you thought it was gonna be. Um, that's kind of the first step here is in the hunting and the gathering. And this is just really a sample of some of the items that you're gonna find in your collection. Carousels of slides, uh, small boxes of slides, memorabilia, children's artwork, the negatives, many different formats of negatives. There's different types of albums, the sticky albums versus the albums that, you know, you're, that slip and slide into those pages. Um, see what else, documents, we talked about that a little bit, newspaper articles, uh, all of the tapes, the VHS tapes, um, photos that are stuck together, I'm gonna, I'll drop in on that one. Um, for now, I would put those to the side. Um, those are the kind of things that can really, pardon the pun, get you stuck, right? Like if you get stuck on that one particular group of photos, then it might keep you from moving forward and really getting things kind of compartmentalized. Um, because what you may find is that you have duplicates of those photos somewhere else. Uh, and VHS and videotapes, those kind of things, find a bin for those. And, and if you look at this list, this, this list actually is how I would and how we here compartmentalize things when projects come in. So if we have boxes of loose photos, we're gonna keep all of those together. If we have boxes of photos that are in envelopes, we keep those together. If we have loose negatives, we're gonna put those in a bin by themselves. Uh, slides, we're gonna compartmentalize those off to their own. Memorabilia and documents and children's artwork. And this is where involving some of your family might become kind of important. 
So the children's artwork. Have you asked your children if they really want their artwork back? Chances are good. They might want some of it, but probably not all of it. So that might be one of the first places where you can really let go of some bigger stuff, right? Um, we've seen many bins of children's artwork and the kids, the kids don't want that. Um, or they may just want a few pieces of it. Let me let me uh, jump in on that one sure. because the um, with the children's artwork, I, I love this approach and I never really thought about it that way. I, I think as parents, we are all we you know look through that children's artwork and it's so hard to get rid of it because we're so emotionally tied to it. And, uh, but we only look at it when we're cleaning up our house. Like, it's not like the, the really, you know, it's, we still have pieces of children artwork on our wall and I admire that, but, uh, I never thought about it as that is one, how important the, because the only person that's going to appreciate that artwork is a parent, a grandparent or a, or the child that created that artwork. Mm -hmm. And uh, bringing the child who's now an adult into that process uh, it must be very result producing, I guess, but also it may also create a lot of other emotions, right? It could for sure. I think what we see quite often is the artwork that the children or that the child gave to the grandparent ends up coming back in the box of now that they they're now inheriting it back right <laughs> because yeah. they gave it to the grandparent we're cleaning out uh grandma and grandpa's house and now that artwork is back in the back in the fold again and, and there are certainly ways to preserve that artwork if it's important um i mean my stick figures from when i was eight years old i don't want those now if i was an actual artist, I might appreciate having those pieces. Um, and those might be important pieces to digitize and uh, preserve in, you know, archival materials. Um, but I think each, each family is, you know, you, you really need to have those conversations. Yeah, yeah. And I think, honestly, you could probably have those conversations about just about every item on that list, right? Um, having an honest conversation with your family and saying, what are the important things to keep? Like the newspaper articles, you know, I, I know there were newspaper articles in my personal collection where maybe I was in a newspaper for something and my aunt sent a copy and my grandmother sent a copy <laughs> and my mom cut out a copy. We don't need three copies. Yep. Yep. And for me, having it digitized is enough at that point. Um, right? Since you've got this list on the screen, Joanne had a question. Why do you organize by type of material rather than timeline? So this is the first step. Uh, we do timeline later. Okay, yep. that makes and, sense. And, and you know, again, because I have gone through one of these projects on my own, uh, not to completion, but I made the mistake of splitting up um pictures from collections uh like i i i i applaud you for your suggestion is if there's a collection keep it together because when they get all mixed up you begin to okay which set of grandparents was this photo from and uh keeping it together as is uh would have been a great approach to to my little project yeah and in some cases having pulling them apart will make sense eventually but i think getting this initial stage done first so that you really do have a more global understanding of what you've got like do you have both sides of your parents collection here and kind of getting a sense of of where things came from um but yeah consolidating them and compartmentalizing them by type also is going to lend itself towards the final archival boxes that these things are going to move into. Okay. So we don't really want to keep our newspaper articles with our photos. Yep. Yep. Um, the beautiful part of digitizing is once they're digitized, you can 
combine them however you want, right? Like you can use metadata that becomes searchable. You can add file names that include dates and sort by those dates and bring the digital collection together in a chronologic way if you want, um, which typically is what we end up doing in, you know, when it's all done, that's what it looks like digitally. Um, but how we store these items is gonna probably be a little bit different from each, each other. So slides have their own box and negatives may or may not have their own box. It just depends it. on the volume of each of those things. Cool. All right. Well, we're getting tons of questions here. I'll let you get through okay. some of these slides and then okay. that'll probably trigger more questions. And um, uh, this is great. Uh, okay. All right. So let's see here. Okay. So initial organization is placing like with like. So we've kind of already covered that. Um, keeping those photos that are grouped together, grouped together. Keep the negatives with the photos for now. Um, and, and honestly, for the, the long term, that probably makes sense too. If we're going to be digitizing those, 99% of the time, the negative is going to get you a better copy of that digital image than the actual print because the print is more likely to have faded or deteriorated in some way. So the negatives are going to get you a better digital copy. Sometimes it's a negligible difference. And so you have to make those decisions based on what your collection looks like. Um, you know, loose photos for us, when we bring a collection in and we have a big giant kind of messy collection, uh, if we just have boxes of just loose photos, we're just gonna pull those, put those loose photos in a shoe box by themselves until we can get back to that. So we are definitely in a compartmentalizing uh, mode when, when a collection first comes in. Uh, some of the ways that you can almost immediately reduce the volume of the collection is, again, removing from albums, but this is a very personal decision. So if those are albums that you or your family looks through frequently, removing photos from albums might not be the answer for you. If you are looking to downsize your collection, removing the photos from those albums might be the answer for you because you can also recreate those albums digitally, um, you know, have reprints made of those albums and they, the newer modern albums take up less space than the traditional you know, slip and slide albums or those sticky albums. Photos that are in those old sticky magnetic albums, I would take them out of those because they are just not, photo friendly. Um, in most cases, they're, they're not archival quality. Sometimes photos are just falling out. Sometimes they're really stuck in there. Uh, so you really can get a variety from those types of albums, but that can be a way to immediately reduce the size of this collection. Uh, removing the garbage, right? There's so often we see receipts and extra envelopes and you know, the school portraits came in three different envelopes, right? Removing those envelopes, that excess paper can also immediately reduce the size, uh, keeping one copy of your portraits. And this is another area where you could compartmentalize, right? So if, you, if your family had a history of, of having a lot of uh, professional portraits done, you could have you know, a stack of photos that's your professional portraits, a stack of photos that's all your, you know, your, your school portraits for each of the children then you can go back into those smaller stacks and, and remove the, the duplicates. And my recommendation on that is keep the five by sevens or smaller. Typically five by sevens or smaller are gonna fit in a photo, an archival photo box. Um, larger than that, then you have to find other solutions for those oversized pieces. Bigger is not necessarily always better unless it's just in better condition. Um, so if you're looking to digitize the collection and the eight by 10 is in perfect condition and your five by seven is faded, then keep the eight by 10, but all else is equal. I would keep the five by seven or smaller, uh, five by seven or four by six, um, get rid of the duplicates, those envelopes of, or the days of going to the drugstore and buying one set and getting three copies for free, that was not really free. <laughs> we pay for that now. Um, get rid of the duplicates. I know you're probably saying in your head, but my sister-in-law might like those photos or my brother might like copies of those photos. 
have them digitized. They can get the digital copies. Um, if you really, really think that they're gonna want them because they've got their own photo mess to take care of, if you really think that they want them and you really think that you're gonna follow through and hand those photos off, then by all means do it. Um, but I would say 99 times out of 10, no one's gonna know that you got rid of those duplicate photos. Uh, purge the sunsets and the landscapes, the blurries, the darks, the overexposed, the underexposed. Um, go ahead and get rid of those. If, if it's the only photo that you have of great grandma Jones, maybe you keep it, right? Like if there is something historically significant about it or family significant about it and it, and it grabs you, then keep that photo. Otherwise, if you've got 10 photos that all look about the same, keep one. Um, and that's the almost duplicates, right? We call those redundant here in our shop. Um, if there's information on the envelopes, you can transfer that information to the envelopes. You can actually get rid of the envelope and put an index card in there for now, right? Right on that index card, a description of that group of photos. Maybe if you have a date, include the date. That would be information that's gonna be really useful when it comes time to scan those photos. Um, moving photos and associated negatives to archival envelopes and toss the drugstore envelopes. So again, this is something that you could do. Uh, keeping those prints and those negatives together is gonna be really helpful, uh, especially if you're gonna be doing scanning and you're, if, if higher quality is really important to you, then you're gonna wanna scan those negatives versus the prints. Um, so <laughs> this is this picture. Uh, is actually uh, Nancy's photo collection. And so Nancy was the one that was gonna come and, and share a little bit about her experience uh, in, in this process. And she is out sick today, unfortunately. So let's send her all some good thoughts. Um, but this is what she dropped off at our shop in, I guess it was 2021. And there are about 16 boxes here, I believe. And this consisted of photos from her parents' home and also her own personal collection. So there were actually two, this was two photo collections in this group. Um, it was quite a collection. They led some amazing lives and were very active and had, had such a fun collection of, of photos in here. So she was very appreciative of now being able to see this collection in a whole new way. We handed her literally a thumb drive and everything that, you know, she wanted to see is, is in there. Um, so she came to us because she was cleaning out her parents' home um, and they were selling it and they were preparing, preparing to sell the home. And they really just needed a place. They knew they wanted to deal with this collection, but they also needed a place to put these photos where they felt safe. And so she was working with an organizer and she and her organizer came by and dropped these all off. I can't believe that these all fit in one car. It may have been two cars that they brought these in. Um, so they chose, Nancy chose to hire a professional because A, she, she really didn't know where to start and it was would be incredibly overwhelming. This would take years for somebody to do on their own. Um, because of the sentimentality that's attached to our family photos. Um, you know, hire a professional when it's something you're only going to have to do maybe one time. So what I mean by that is that initial organizational structure, really, you're going to only do that one time with this collection, with the help of God, right? So allowing someone else to do that piece of the process um, kind of removes you from it, removes you from that rabbit hole, um, removes you from the emotion of it, right? Um, hire, hire out a professional when it involves the technical and maybe technical is not your thing. So what we did here is we organized and then we digitized and then we rehoused everything into archival boxes. And we sent home with her probably four four of those plastic bins with archival you know the archive everything was rehoused in archival boxes but then the archival boxes we had in about four bins i think that went home with her um 
so that clearly took up probably, I don't know, an eighth of the space that this current looks like, right? Man, that, that's pretty amazing. And I'm, a, I'm assuming that and and it's too bad we don't have Nancy here, but she could potentially even uh, dispose of some of those archival boxes. Uh, but it but I know there is this emotion to those original uh, photos that are is hard to break. It is. It is. And we um, when we work with a client like Nancy, we have, we have her fill out uh, a questionnaire and it's probably four or five pages long. And in there, she fills out why she's chosen to move forward with this process, right? Like, why is she, you know, and what we're gaining from that is what her sentimentality is around her photos. So some people are relieved to hand it over. Some people are feeling a little bit of anxiety about handing it over. That helps us know how much we can curate. It kind of gives us a gate, our curation gauge, right? And if we know that somebody is super sentimental about things, then we're going to apply a little bit different filter to our curating process than somebody that's like, I want this downsized. I want it to be a quarter of the size that it was. In fact, I'm going to toss these photos when it's all digitized. And we have we have folks that have done that. Um, that helps us gauge how we're going to curate those collections. Okay. And so we don't apply the same filter to everyone, right? So, um, you know, it's still, it's still going to be much faster than if you were to do it yourself, Got quite it. frankly, right? Um, when I first started this business and I would go work in people's homes, I would work with them at their dining room table and we'd have all their boxes of photos out and we'd work through those photos. And what I realized once, once I moved out of my home office and I had a, a physical space where people could bring things to, to us, I realized how much more efficient I could be on or how much more efficient we could be on somebody else's collection without them there. Mm -hmm. I don't mean that to sound um, light or disrespectful, but because we're not emotionally attached to those photos, we can get through that process more efficiently. I think it's less emotional for the client. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. and I know this will sound a little flippant, but in some cases, you're not going to know what photo we pulled out, right? because you don't even know that it was there. And I, and I don't mean that in a disrespectful way either, because we are applying a very careful filter to all of those collections, but we're not going to weigh a decision. You know, if we have two photos that are practically identical, we're going to pull one out and you're not going to know that that one photo was pulled out. You won't even remember that that photo was there, but we've kept the best one. Mm -hmm. um, so that's how that process how we can probably downsize a little bit better and more efficiently, because depending on how sentimental you are, you may be inclined to keep everything. Yep. And if we have clients that come in and we know that they're incredibly sentimental, we do apply that filter to it. And, and I'm like, okay, don't throw anything out. Like, and, and we'll pull everything out that we feel is a duplicate or redundant or just poor quality. We put it in a box and that allows the client an opportunity to review them one final time before they dispose of them. I love it. I'm, I'm looking at the clock and I yep, want to make sure we get through these, uh, these questions that have come in. Yep. Um, let's see. Uh, do you have uh, another slide slide to share? Or are you, um, I have some more, but I'm happy to go on to the questions. Yeah. Yeah. Um, let's, let's jump into these here. So, yeah. uh, so, okay. We'll get through these folks. Um, all right. As the surviving adult child, now I have multiple framed family photo portraits. I hope you will address how to deal with the framed photo portraits. So, um, okay. So uh, what I would do with those is pull those aside. Um, once you identify what all is in your collection, you may find that there is another copy of those photos and maybe a smaller one, another copy of those photos within your collection that is in actually better condition 
because what happens to those family portraits that have been hanging on the wall is they do have a tendency to fade if they're not behind uh, the right kind of glass. So first I would say, you know, pull out the ones that you know you want to keep, right? Pull them aside. If you know that you're going to, um, if you want to have them digitized, they can be digitized for archival purposes and for per uh, personal purposes. Um, you can remove them from the frames. They can go into archival boxes. My recommendation there would be is if you want to hang those back up again, have a reprint made and hang mm -hmm. the reprint, but let's keep the original in a safe archival box. That's um, great. Yeah. Um, and then, and then I, I agonize over the frames because the frames look beautiful, but what I found is half the time they're not very functional because they're old frames. Uh, yeah. But, but being able to let go of those things. Um, now, uh, a few questions. Uh, I know we talked about the photo quality pencils, but uh, Pat, Mary Pat is asking why a pencil instead of a pen? Um, um, just so it, the pen, sometimes it has, um, especially if it's like a ballpoint pen, it's gonna be, it's gonna be a pointy tip. And when you write on the back of that photo, it might leave a depression in the photo. Okay. Yeah. And then and, and the ink might smear onto the photo next to it. Do people ever use like stickers? But I imagine if you wanted to pull a sticker off, you might damage the uh, the picture that way as well. Yeah. I mean, you can use a sticky note temporarily if you wanted. OK. Um, but I wouldn't keep a sticky note in there permanently okay. if you wanted to have it in there as a way, um, you know, as a temporary measure to identify somebody. Um, but frankly, I would use a photo safe pencil on that instead. Okay. And then the, um, uh, somebody, uh, Linda asks, how do I separate photos that are stuck together? Yeah. So that can be tricky. Um, it depends on how they were printed. Um, if they were printed on your home printer and they're now stuck together, those I would probably go ahead and just, I would reprint those. Hopefully you have them digital someplace else if you printed them on your home printer. Um, because of the inkjet, that kind of stuff, you, it's hard to get them apart. Um, lab printed photos. Some people try the freezer, put them in the freezer, oh, it hardens, okay. and sometimes they can come apart. Um, sometimes you can soak them in water. Um, but again, I would, sometimes you just have to just let it go. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, and hopefully through this process, you will have found additional copies of those maybe, or maybe you'll have the negative someplace that you could have those digitized and have those photos reprinted. Um, um, think about it from a, you know, a broader spectrum is if you have a collection of 8,000 photos and you've got 10 that are stuck together and the whole scheme of things, you might need to let some of those go. Um, I do have some resources uh, listed at the end of this um, slideshow. Let me- Yeah, go to that to because- end. I'll uh, get to that because uh, then you can mark those down. Ah, um, great. Um, um, and on the Image okay, the Permanent question, Institute, they they, will, there are some uh, suggestions in there on photos that are stuck together. Okay, great. And um, okay, so I'm thinking, uh, Anne asks, where do I find archival materials? Is yep. that um, archival methods? Yes, that's one of my favorites. So I would go with archival methods. They are lovely people. Um, you can actually call them on the phone and tell them what you have and they will kind of walk you through um, boxes maybe that, that might be helpful in your, um, in your collection. Typically you're gonna look for uh, shoe boxes, maybe depending on the size of your collection. I like the the shoe box size archival boxes because they're just a little bit easier to handle. Now, there are some that are double size, but they can get heavy. Okay, and I'm dropping this um, website in. Yep. Another question was asking about the archival boxes. Yep. Are they just pl plastic bins? Like, is there a difference between your traditional Tupperware box and um, uh, an archival box that you would buy at archival methods. Yeah, so the boxes that you're gonna get from archival methods are are boxes, like like boxes. Um, 
you know, paper feeling boxes. Um, I'm missing the words there right now at the moment. Um, the plastic bins really are more of a temporary solution and because you want a little bit of breathability there. So what happens with a, a plastic bin, if they close up too tightly and there's moisture in the environment, um, that can trap the moisture in there, and which can also start then the deterioration process and um, you know mold and mildew and those kind of things. So I would probably not store my boxes in plastic okay. bins permanently. So these, as you can see, I'm on the website yep. there, and these are what you're referring to. So the yeah. plastic bins are more of a, a temporary. Yep. Style. Okay, got yeah. it. Got it. Yep. Okay. Um, let's see. Okay. Um, I didn't mean to jump off of that. Let's okay. see. Okay. So we got the archival bins. We got the, the there. Uh, okay. What do you do with photos? The photos reduced from a collection were all the photo collections destroyed. Yeah. So the, the photos that you're not going to use, what, uh, where do those go? Is there like a responsible recycling way to get rid of photos? <laughs> yeah, unfortunately, most now you, you need to check with your local uh, landfill. But I know here in Howard County, the last time I checked, photos that are printed at a commercial lab are not recyclable. So okay. photos that you've printed at home on your home inkjet printer are recyclable, but your commercially printed photos are not. Um, so typically what we do here is if we have a client, it just depends on the client. Some clients want us to dispose of them because I think frankly, they don't, they don't wanna know. Um, other clients are a little bit more sentimental and they want to have an opportunity to look through those photos one last time before they dispose of them. Um, okay. Uh, CR Wilson has a question. What are the strategies to purge duplicates in the phone, the cloud, like Amazon photos on the computer? And I want to, uh, I talked to Rachel about this before our discussion and we have already put on the calendar um, a, another discussion where we are going to focus 100% on digital uh, photos. But uh, for Rachel, if you want, and that's going to be on August 22nd, uh, Rachel, if you want to um, share, uh, and I'll drop the, uh, the login for that, share any tips that somebody might use on the the phone i mean you talk about those duplicate photos it's even worse on our phones right uh, <laughs> it can be yeah um so it's a little bit similar process in that the first thing that you want to do is consolidate everything and that's where people kind of get stuck on that too right like they're all of a sudden the if you know you have photos on amazon you know you have photos on your icloud account you know you have photos on uh, a thumb drive somewhere, or some DVDs somewhere. The first step there is consolidating everything into one place and then running a piece of software on it to find those duplicates and remove the duplicates. Uh, the trick there is knowing which duplicates to remove because what you wanna do is remove the lowest quality duplicate and keep your original. Um, so there's a couple of different apps out there that you can use. If you're a Mac person, you can use um, Photo Sweeper. Um, for Windows, I know I have it around here somewhere. I, we just don't use it here very often, but there's a couple of different Windows programs. There might be some other photo organizers online here too that can uh, chime in about some Windows apps for photo for duplicates. Um, but there's also on your iPhone, if you go to if you go to your library, let's see here. So if you go to your, your um, photos library and then you go to albums, um, what you don't see on this initial screen, and I don't know if you can see this or not, but um, if you scroll down, there's actually a place down here and I think I deleted mine. Oh, nope, there is one. There's an album called Duplicates. Hmm. So in my case, I only have six on there right now, but I could delete those six photos that are duplicates. Um, there's also... There's also on here one that says screenshots and you wow. could delete those. Those are the ones where you take a screenshot of the weather forecast and send it to somebody. Um, okay, well, this is, I, yeah. I bet you we could really get in the weeds <laughs> on some of these tips yes. 
on August 22nd. Okay, great. Yep. And then, um, okay, uh, Judith asks, how are the images organized on the thumb drive? Like when you when you send them, can you search those easily on the thumb drive? Yes. So what we do is when we organize the physical collection, we're going to put that in as close to chronological order as possible. Um, and then when we scan, we are scanning, we are scanning the same way, right? We're scanning those groups of photos that are in chronological order into, into digital groups and digital folders. And we name them with a year, a month, and a day if we have it. And so then the magic of the computer is that it can sort those. Uh, it sorts them chronologically. So you're going to then have chronological folders. And if you wanted to search for specific things, um, we can add metadata to those once things are digitized. Sometimes there's enough information in the file name or the folder name that allows you to be able to search there. But um, adding metadata to those digital collections will go a huge way in their searchability and shareability. And that's something that even once it's been digitized, we hand that collection back to a client and they can add the metadata um, or the keywords. A lot of people would know that as keywords. You know. Okay, great. Um, okay, let's see, let me get back on track here. Okay, um, do you go through negatives the same way as the photos? And those are so much harder, the, the, Martha says, those yeah. are so much harder to see and to separate, how do you how do you sort through those? Yeah, so it gets a little tricky. Um, so that's where keeping the photos with the negatives is kind of important because that will give you a, a window into what's on those negatives. If if you can you know compare two two or three and you know that that's those strips of negatives actually belong with that envelope of photos, you know keep them together. Um, the trick with negatives. And, and prints is, you know, if, if you sort through your prints and you weed out 10 out of 24, now you have 14 left that you wanna scan. Um, if you want the higher quality with the negatives, sometimes you have to then scan more negatives than prints, right? Because the time that it would take to figure out which negatives you wanna keep, it, it just gets a little bit hairy. So there's a little bit of a, um, I don't know, there's a balancing act there and you kind of have to make a decision on, should I just have all of the negatives scanned? Now, when we do scanning, if we see something that's incredibly blurry or dark or you know, overexposed, we don't scan it, we just skip over it. Okay. Um, but you kind of have to balance, balance there a little bit. Like how much do I curate out on the prints if I know I'm gonna be scanning the negatives? Um, you know, maybe you do a quick sort on the prints just to get rid of the bulk, right? Okay. Um, but then you scan the negatives. Great. And I just wanted to, I just glanced at the clock. We've gone over an hour, but if, if you're okay hanging on, Rachel, yep. it doesn't surprise me on this topic. Uh, <laughs> we'll get through the questions. I'm reminding everybody that it's uh, recorded. And then we've had some requests uh, for your slides. Would you be willing to sure. share the slides, especially that last Tape the last yep. uh, one. I'll put that on the recording link as well, so you can access that. And I'll try to drop in all the websites, so you just click on them. Um, okay, let's see. Um, okay, so that's taken care of. Okay, Arlene says I have a newspaper print that showed my grandmother, me, and my mother and three aunts listening to a radio broadcast by my two uncles during World War II. What would you do with that newspaper print? Uh, I would digitize it and then I would place it in archival storage. Okay. Yep. I get and, the right kind um, of sleeve and, 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 or folder and place that in an archival box. Okay. And then uh, Joanne asks, are there any software programs or apps that you recommend for the do it yourselfers? Um, Joanne, can you elaborate on like what you are looking for them to do? Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Joanne, throw that in to Q and A or chat. Yeah. Like from an organizing standpoint or from. So it sounds to me like, well, I, I bet you anything what she's, Hey, could I just sign up for a software program and it takes care of all this stuff? <laughs> like, is there sort of a, a, um, put things in chronological order, find duplicates and put them into an album. 
Um, okay, so um, that would be, so she's looking for software that could help put things in chronological order, find duplicates and put them into an album. Yep, so, okay. So Mac or Windows, it's gonna, it wouldn't matter if you were Mac or Windows. What I use personally for my personal photo collection is Lightroom. Um, Lightroom. It can be, it can be a bit of a beast, um, but that's what I, it, it helps me with uh, keeping things organized from a chronological standpoint. I can add metadata there. Um, I can check a little box and say, don't import duplicates. Uh, it doesn't mean that they don't slip through, um, but that's my organizational tool because I can okay. put those photos into annual monthly. You know. and, and I see that um, I pulled it up here and I'm dropping it into chat. Lightroom is an Adobe product. So Correct. Um, yeah, I, I, it's probably does more than you could ever imagine, but yes. it's, uh, it's so I can see why a professional would be, uh, be yep. using that. Um, okay. And if you're a you know a Mac user, you can use the Photos app. If that's something that you're comfortable with, you can add metadata there. Mm -hmm. um, but you're not going to see the same kind of file structure in Photos as you would in a Lightroom. Uh, there's also an Adobe product called uh, Bridge, Adobe Bridge, and it's actually a free resource. Mm -hmm. And um, that might actually be a good good option for people that are getting started with um, doing some organization. Okay. Um, so that would be an option, and that would also be cross-platform, cross-platform between Windows and Mac. Um, okay. No, that's a good one here, and I've uh, I pulled this one up, and I'm dropping it in uh, to chat as well. Perfect. Um, okay. Uh, I wanted to save these two questions, and then I'm going to get to chat. And sure. one person says, "I hope this question doesn't interrupt the road." But what photo services and care do you actually provide? For a family and individuals. And then Myra is asking, how do we access professionals? So you mentioned you're in Columbia, Maryland. That's right. We've got people all over the place. If mm -hmm. somebody, if you're not convenient to drop off the, the box, yep. uh, maybe you could help us figure out how people can find someone. And then you and your, your services, what do those look like? Yeah, so our services here are, we can do all of it for you, or we can do whatever piece you want us to do. So literally like Nancy's boxes that you saw, she dropped those boxes off. She hadn't opened those boxes probably ever, right? They were in her parents' home. Um, so you could drop the boxes off. We will organize them. We will digitize them and we will rehouse them in archival boxes and hand it all back to you call it done. Um, if you are the type of person that wants to have more control over both budget and just you want you want to be involved with the organization process, you can um, do the organizing yourself and bring us the organized batches and we'll digitize them for you and we can rehouse them in archival boxes or we can hand it back to you in whatever boxes you gave them to us. So we really can kind of meet you at, at, at any stage of that process. Uh, we can do, um, you know, we can design custom books for you, um, whether it's a family history or a photo book, you know, just an annual, an annual book or a travel book or a special event. Um, okay. We can do those right. pieces for and you. And um, Grace is wondering, how are the costs determined for your services? So for us, it can be hourly or it can be per piece. So organizing, the pre-scan organizing, the post-scan organizing are... Um, by the hour. And then um, scanning is by the piece. Um, okay. Yeah. And um, yep. and then if, if let's say that somebody's in Washington state, I mean, obviously they can mm -hmm. ship things to you, but, yep. but what would be your guidance on a, a place to find other professionals like you? Yep. So you could go to the photo managers. Um, there is a resource on the photo managers where you can find certified professionals. Uh, there likely are other professionals also in your area, but the certified ones are the ones that are going to show up on that website in, um, in the directory. So you can plug in, I think you can plug in your, your state or your town or your zip code, and it should pull up some certified professionals that are in your area. Okay. Um, and I'm trying and, to get 
that, and each uh, one's a little bit different. So you need to just kind of take a look and see what services that you want. Cause there are some people that specialize really only in one thing. Um, and, and maybe they work with other photo managers in their area. You know, one may do the organizing, one may do the scanning. Uh, we've just been around so long that there weren't other professionals in the area when we got started. Um, so we really just kind of adapted and, and, you know, took those pieces on. Um, and um, so, yeah. yeah. And on, on the recording, I will put the link to our discussion with the founder of the photo managers, which is the one that we had before this. Yep, it, that's Kathy that's Nelson. Great. Yep. Um, and then um, let's see, the Nancy example was so great. Many thanks to you and Nancy for sharing this. Yeah, I really wish Nancy I was know. here. You, you all yeah. know, I love featuring real life people. So get well, Nancy. Yes. Um, do you personally work here in Columbia? Do you work with folks in Montgomery County, Bethesda and Rockville? We do. Yep. Okay, great. Yep. And um, let's see. Uh, oh, come on. The here. VHS tapes. Oh, yeah. Okay. So uh, you mentioned VHS tapes. Can you mm -hmm. talk about how you deal with those? I noticed yeah. they were on the bottom of your list. <laughs> <laughs> Um, well, that is also one of the places probably where, depending on the size of your collection, you really could reduce the volume and the space that that takes up. You could reduce the footprint, problem, depending on your collection. Um, but VHS, VHSC, um, you know, the video eight millimeter, uh, the uh, mini DVs, all of those cassettes, you can convert those into MP4. Uh, formats, which then makes them so much easier to view and share. There's some great new apps that are out there now. I'm kind of testing one out here um, where once they're digitized, you can put them on the app and watch them on your TV, like, like Netflix, which is actually really cool. Um, and that is, oh my gosh, it left me. Um, projector, oh. the projector app. Um, projector. Okay, great. So it's, um, it's kind of in its beta and infancy at the moment. Um, so you have to be a little bit patient, but I'm loving the fact that I can put my videos up there and we can watch them at home now. I had some on this weekend and that was kind of fun. Great. And then Sarah asks, is it best to have professional scan prints and photos or slides? I think this came up in the photo manager's discussion. It takes a fair amount of investment in getting a scanner that is going to... Um, uh, be easy to use, uh, I guess. Yeah, so. I mean, there's there's lots of variables. So depending on how technical you are, um, how easily you get frustrated, those are all things to weigh. I think that a professional is going to get you a professional quality image. If you haven't done this before and you don't know what settings to use, there's the the chance that you're going to scan those images and you're going to have to do it again. Um, fragile photos things like that, that you don't want to pass those fragile photos through any kind of a feeder scanner. Um, photos that ha have the mirroring, the vintage photos where there's some mirroring and, and oxidation that's happening on those. Um, you know, traditional scanner is not going to get you the best copy, uh, the best digital copy of those. So I think you really have to know yourself. And if, if that's something that you're into doing, then by all means, experiment with it. But but you're going to want to get a, a quality scanner to do that. Um, what we do here is a little bit different. We use cameras for everything here. So mm. whether it's a slide or a negative or a print, we're doing what's called copy stand work. And so they're high resolution, full frame cameras. You know, they start out as 45 megapixel um, or megabyte photos. Um, so they're huge files that we're dealing with here. And then we, um, you know, do our post-processing and hand you back a usable um, archival quality digital image. Um, so yeah, it really just kind of depends on what your, what your personal preference is there. So for the technical piece of it, I would say if you're really trying to manage your budget, I would say do the organizing yourself, but let the pros do the scanning. Mm -hmm. um, that's probably, that's where my, okay. where my recommendation would be. Um, well, I knew that this was going to go along. We've got a, but I'm, I'm scanning through some of the chats, but while I'm doing this, one of the things folks that I talked to about with Rachel, we have been experimenting with sort of taking a deeper dive into some of the topics that we discuss here. And um, Rachel's agreed in the fall to explore sort of doing 
uh, like a mastermind class where a group of folks that are interested in organizing their photos, we could come together maybe on a weekly basis and tackle this as a group. Um, if you're interested in that, send me an email and we'll see what kind of uh, feedback we can get. And maybe we bring a group together that Rachel is leading. Um, okay, let's see. Uh, we're going to get the presentation. I, I dropped in uh, Rachel's contact information. Um, how do you obtain a print from digitized negative, both black and white and in color? Um, how, how would you get a print of those? So what we would do here is once we digitize it, we turn that negative into a positive. And then what we could do is then also change that if you wanted it in black and white, we can then um, convert the image to black and white pretty easily. And then we generally will order those prints from a commercial lab, but you could order them from a Shutterfly or Snapfish Walgreens or Walgreens if yeah, you wanted. Yeah. Um, you know, if it's an important photo, I generally would go to a more commercial lab yep, yep. Um, because they'll get the color right. Okay. Um, let's see. Uh, how do you digitize newspaper articles? I think you just explained that you take a picture of it, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. But uh, because that's an example of, if you wanted to save the entire front page of the newspaper, um, a scanner that would be large enough to effectively do that would be challenging. It, yeah, it's challenging either way. I mean, we have a little okay. bit of magic that we've got to do when we have something that large, um, you know, to get a good good quality there. But but yeah, it can for those big pieces, it can be certainly a challenge. And let's see, what about uh, reel to reel tapes? We haven't brought those up. Um, oh, real to real. Um, yes. So there are definitely some folks out there that do real to real. That's on my agenda probably in the next six to eight months. Um, but I, um, there's definitely folks out there that do real to real in a, in a quality way. Um, a few local, a few that I would probably um, ship to. Okay. I think we pretty much covered it. Wow. Uh, this is, um, uh, but, but I've got all your contact info. I'm going to sh share it with the, um, uh, at the recording and folks, if there's something that you needed, uh, Rachel's great and, uh, send her an email and she should be yeah, able to me. respond to you. Yeah. Um, a reminder, which I'll put on the link, we're going to do exclusively digital in August and have a discussion where we just talk about digital photos. And then in the fall, you know, maybe we'll we'll play around with doing a class. I see that some people are already interested yep. in that. Yep. And, um, but Rachel, uh, thanks so much. I know this is, uh, it's overwhelming. And um, <laughs> for a lot of us uh, who tried doing this on our own. So having a resource out there like you and your colleagues with the, uh, the, the photo managers is awesome. Yep. And um, we will uh, we'll, we will be talking to you again soon. I'm excited to be working with you. And thanks everybody for your great questions. And yeah, they were hopefully great questions. we answered most of them. Uh, and I think the important thing you shared is you gave us a glimpse of the behind the scenes, how a professional organizes their photos. And we can all play around with that. But I think the thing that I took away from it is, is the more you can kind of get, do the organization process on your own, uh, the more prepared you're gonna to be to hand over things to a professional. Or if you wanna do it on your own, now that you're organized, you just break it off into little pieces. Yeah, it's much easier once you're organized to then you could scan, you could scan chunks at a time. It's, you know, bite the elephant off in small pieces, right? So it's the hunt and gather, compartmentalize, and then you know what you have and you know which pieces you can start to attack in, in smaller pieces instead of the big daunting group. Yep. And then uh, Arlene threw in this, and, and I think this is a good question, is just to give us a rough idea of your cost, you'd mentioned hourly and then per piece. Like what what numbers are we talking about there? So for scanning of prints, they're $1.05 a piece. Uh, for negatives and slides, they're $1.25 a piece. Um, our, our hourly rate is 125. Okay. Um, great. And is that pretty standard industry wide? Uh, I think it varies. I think okay. it varies. There's people that are higher. There's people that are lower. Okay. Um, 
yeah, it's, it's going to vary. Okay, cool. Probably also in the part of the country that you're in. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Well, Rachel, this is awesome. Uh, Thanks everybody. And we'll have the recording and podcast up later today. All right. It's been my pleasure. Thanks.